Welcome to Life Support Live, the <laughs> weekly Star Trek show that helps you to boldly go in your own life to better ourselves and the rest of humanity. As a famous starship captain once said, <laughs> and as another famous starship captain once said, okay, a century earlier, hey, wherever our mission takes us, we'll try to have a little fun along the way. Hello, everyone. I am psychologist Dr. Ali Matu. And I'm Dr. Trek, Larry Nimacek. Uh, one of us is a real doctor, actually. And as always, uh, we'll leave it to you to figure out who that might be. I don't know who it is, Larry. I don't know. Um, we'll we'll find out who that might be. A doctor uh, of what? <laughs> <laughs> so I am. Um, yeah. What are we talking about? Oh, um, today it's a uh, it's a little <laughs> bit of a Valentine's Day. I, I was trying to figure out what are we what are we doing here later. Today's a little. I bit... wonder that every week, Ollie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's um a little bit of a Valentine's Day episode. We are talking about love of stuff. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> not yeah. to be confused for those who remember this. Not to be confused with the long running soap opera of the Electric Company on PBS when we were kids. Love of chair. Anyway, um, yes, love of stuff, which was a yeah. brilliant idea that you, well, you had the idea and then I got the tagline. So, yeah, 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 yeah. It was a good uh, two hit combo. Uh, we should work together where... sometime. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We should maybe do a show together or something. I don't know. We'll, we'll figure that out in the future. Hey, everybody. So, uh, l while we're getting, uh, while we're kind of getting ready, um, why don't you all uh, let us know in the comments what's your favorite episode of Star Trek that features a character? loving a thing might be an engineer loving a starship might be a captain with a certain um certain <laughs> love for a very specific object let us know and while we're getting started larry um get us oriented what is life support live if this might be someone's first time here well let me tell you all about Life support. No, it, I, for some reason that just that was just triggering. No, hey guys, and I want to say shout out yes to our chat. It's already blowing up in a good way here. Hopefully, <laughs> if you're new to the show, join in with the chat. Make sure to find it whatever platform you're on. Uh, every week we hear we say we go boldly through uncertain times. We're looking at Star Trek through a mental health lens or mental health through a Star Trek lens. You take your pick, but we geek out. We have a lot of fun. Hopefully you even might have some um, pointers to take home for your daily life. And it's certainly been a daily life lately, hasn't it? Yeah, um, there's been we, a we lot. We do have a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so enjoy, enjoy the uh, group. Just one note, and I say this, um, if you are on Twitch or YouTube, you will see all the comments. If you're on Facebook, you're in the vast majority, but you don't see the YouTubers and the Twitchers comments, just to say. But we love yeah. everybody. Uh, it's great to see everybody again this week. And this topic is really fun because uh, we had a we were working on one, and then you were like, "Oh, it's Valentine's Day. Should we do some <laughs> 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 Valentine's Day?" And I, and it was like, "Well, we did relationships already." And then you you said, "Well, what about engineers loving their starships?" And we, we kind of ticked through a few things, and and I was thinking, okay, well, we don't you know things that are like pets. I don't want to include pets there because that's specific and some other specific things, but then you were going through things. And I said, how about love of stuff, which can be wonderful, but also be problematic too. Problem. So yeah, 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 yeah. It's, I haven't uh, seen the 23rd, 24th century. Well, I guess I've, well, we can talk about this. I started to say, I don't think I've seen a 23rd, 24th century hoarder yet, yeah, but then we yeah. haven't been everywhere. So they're still out there lurking, I'm sure. No, there's plenty of corners of the galaxy left for us to explore. <laughs> um, yeah, this was yeah we we've had another topic that has now been delayed for the second week in a row. Last week we had a special episode um, 
really honoring Christopher Plummer's life and looking at uh, Star mm-hmm. Trek: The Undiscovered Country. So that topic got just delayed, and then this week we're, we're delaying it again. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> yeah, it's uh, we'll, we'll get to that topic. Uh, Probably not next week because we got a different thing. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll get to it eventually. But um, there's already uh, a lot of great comments coming I'm, in. I'm collecting um, topics. They're starting to pile up. Pretty soon yeah. I won't be able to walk between the piles of all the topics that I'm it's collecting. It's a lot of stuff. It's a lot of stuff, Larry. Um, Zaheer says it's also <laughs> Captain Zaheer Day. Zaheer, it's, uh, is it your birthday? If so... Happy birthday, my Yay, friend! Happy birthday! Um, happy birthday! Uh, lovely, uh, l- uh, lovely to have you here. Uh, February birthdays are great, uh, Larry. I'm a big fan of February birthdays. Um, big, big fan of. Nearly them. one twelfth of all people in the world have a February birthday. So yay! You're kidding? No, I, that's that's some uh, new statistics just out. Yeah. Wow! Wow! Well, mm-hmm. um, that's amazing. you would leap for joy over that one. Yes. <laughs> Oh, my gosh. Um, well, the examples are already coming in. Um, mm-hmm. Jared says, um, fascination just, just from in. Deep Space Nine. Um, Mary, I am not – I'm drawing a blank on that Help name. me out. Well, fascination is um, is the is the Betazoid disease, and and, uh, and Luxana spreads it around. It's kind of like the DS9 version of uh, of the Naked Time, Naked Now. Oh. Third season. Right. Uh, was it's not Bendai syndrome? That's Sorax thing. I've gone blank here for a second. I could have just like looked it up and admitted that I didn't realize it off the top of my head because so somebody. Where's the connection to stuff? I don't. You'll have to ask uh, who. Well, had I've it. asked Jared. Jared, let us know. I have yeah. no idea what you're talking about. Um, Glenn is also <laughs> mentioning here. Many Star Trek fans suffer from love of stuff, as in all our Star Trek related collectibles, costumes, T-shirts, hats, mugs. I'm going to talk about that, Glad We're going to get to that in the um, um, the segment I do, Larry. I have a segment. <laughs> it is called the Away Mission and the Counselor's Log. It's That's my right. fault. I didn't mention our st- – <laughs> yes, for all you new people and for all of you who have been here for 47 weeks in a row now, although we're only up to 44 shows. 44, folks. This is our 44th episode. Um uh, uh, yeah, hoarding and 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 stuff. I started to say something there, and I totally forgot what it was. Anyway, yeah, yeah, uh, we'll 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 get to that. Um, yeah, actually, we should. I always forget the first to put up the image for the first segment. Um, but here we go. That's um, what it was. Sex, it's, yes, we're gonna we're gonna talk about uh, <laughs> cases and missions in our mission briefing, and then Ali will have a uh, counselor's log, and then we'll yes. have some away mission tips for you, and we'll have. Hailing frequencies, and I will have a K3 factor for you. What's that you say? Well, stay tuned. Stay tuned. You'll find out. Um, <laughs> Melanie says the Naked Now, Data, and Tasha. Um, is that a love of Data? We're talking about a love of stuff, everybody, <laughs> not love of people. A love of stuff, which I guess you could stretch that if you're not going to include an android as a person. Yeah, but I thought yeah, we were but past we do. that. Yeah, measure of a man. We're we're sort of uh we're sort of uh past mm-hmm. past that. Um and then there's a little bit of a debate going on around pets. Pets are also not um I would mm. not include that in the stuff definition. I specifically said pets are have their own category. I mean, we can right. do a whole show about pets. We could do a whole show. Yeah, and you've actually pets, mentioned that. Yeah, yeah, I said at the beginning, I don't want to, I mean like we I, there's some exclusion. Now I'm talking about just generic Stuff that's not sentient and not living. How about that for a starter? Yes, there okay. we go. There we go. we got some working definitions here. Um, mm-hmm. For purposes of this hour, this this ninety minutes, right, right, right. Like Nathaniel yeah. has, uh, he says the baseball. Like there's only one. The <laughs> one. <laughs> yeah. Um. Okay, let's see here. Which, um, if you want to start in there, I actually sent you that. That's one that's kind of obvious. Yes. Oh, sure. Let me bring that up. Uh, which one, Larry? I was just looking at the comments. Cisco and the baseball. Oh, my gosh. I mean, yes. We all know Cisco and the baseball, but, you know, yes. since I since I spent 10 minutes getting it last night, like, why don't we show it? Here we go. All right. Oh, I'm sorry. I keep forgetting uh, temporarily because Let- thanks to Skype, I can't see anything happening aside from I can see Ali's picture. So. I just made it a little bit bigger. Um, it's uh, it's on the screen, Larry. Why don't you uh, – let's dive into this one. That's actually a happy moment I found rather than where he's usually scowling because he's about to be invaded or he was just invaded. So 
There's actually a happy time with the baseball. Uh, well, so let's let's talk about it. What what does that baseball represent? Well, Doctor Matu, in today's society, <laughs> baseball represents so many. No, well, it's you know, it's, there's a there's a love of baseball that was oh, there's a mini K three. It's that baseball signature because of Michael Piller, and his love of baseball, and the Dodgers, and all things that way. But he loved baseball and just in general and. It's not because the ma- mention of baseball in the first Dixon Hill in The Big Goodbye was not because of Michael, because he wasn't there yet. But he picked up that thread, brought it back, and infused it into DS9. I mean, partly it was helpful because baseball, you could kind of have a ball and a bat, and people could talk about it on their way to a hollow suite or a hollow tick. So yeah. you could kind of, you know, it was like, it was different than Parisi Squares, which was, ooh, something created for Star Trek. But the more they talked about Parisi Squares being a team and or a team of at least two people like we saw or four people like we saw once, uh, I think it was in 1100-1100, but that's hard and make it up. It's like that's why the reason why you had um, uh, handball you know, uh, in DS9 the, when you're yeah. going to actually show a sport and, and water polo became Archer's thing, not not football. It's right. just more compact and easier to produce or even show on a screen. But baseball is so uh, – plus Michael can introduce the thing of it being like almost extinct. And so here's the Cisco's on a mission to keep it alive. And oh my god, right. Cassidy Yates right. wants to keep it alive too. And oh, it's love at first sight. <laughs> so yeah, so that's why baseball. But it became even more than that for Cisco. That baseball on his desk was a symbol of the Federation of Starfleet. Whenever somebody was threatening – you know, when – when uh, when Ducat picks it up and he's getting the evil eye, or when they abandon the station and and Wayun is talking about, oh look, Cisco left the st- the ball behind, you know, and they're like, it's yeah. a, it's a sign, it means he, he's coming back. He's coming back. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. That baseball <laughs> takes on all kinds of uh, symbolism, and then sometimes it's just it's just a metaphor. They pick it up, but like in this scene, I don't I don't remember the moment, but. They're having fun with it, but it was a it was a real it was like Livingston in the fish tank or the Shakespeare book for Picard, you know. It was, which which are other things people have a love of, but it's it's a whole topic of what do people that have the ability to in Star Trek when they have an office, a ready room or whatever. You, it's like, what do they put in their office? You know, it's like set decorators are busy trying to show character. It, that's you know in scriptwriters. But in a character's mind, it's like, what am I going to display of myself in my public place? Yeah, I, I love the baseball for um, all the reasons you mentioned. I didn't really know that history that you talked about, uh, uh, about Michael Pillar's love. Of, no, Larry, I don't know these things. I did. I, I well, mean, there's a whole you, free K3 I just wasted that I could have used on a show. <laughs> I think a lot of, um, from the comments, it seems like uh, a lot of folks do know that history. Maybe I was I was the only one. You um, just have to be patient with Ollie, everybody. <laughs> was, was there anything... Um, Unique to the baseball they use, or or did they just use a variety of different I, they baseballs? They just on got set? a. I think that yeah, they just had one. They there's a couple. You know, the one I'm not sure, but I'm sure it's been in an auction or it's in somebody's personal collection. The baseball that they autographed and used for the promos in Take Me Out to the Hollow Suite. Yeah, you know, there's where they show it and it's all autographed. Uh, I'm not. Maybe somebody is, and I haven't researched it, but uh, I'm sure that is. I'm sure there were two at least, so there was a backup in case one got mussed up or something, but. Um, yeah, I'm sure that there's uh, more than one. And I know fans have had when Avery was at conventions and signing uh, and probably Ciroc and maybe even the entire crew. But I'm sure lots of fans had Avery sign baseballs, you know, while he was at signing events. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm sure that's that's happened a lot. Yeah, it's it's a connection to uh, humanity. It's a way of, of its connection to Earth culture. It's a connection to um it's him expressing part of his identity. Uh, it's uh, I, I love that connection, and um, it's it's a very rare thing for us in Star Trek to see a direct connection to 20th century and now 21st century culture too. We don't often see that in Star Trek. We mm-hmm. they have pads and starships and dilithium and all sorts of stuff that we don't have. But here is Cisco with something that is uh, so us. Um, not only so um, 
not only is it so 20th century, um, but it's also so American culture as well. So I think for a lot of fans, like uh, like Charlotte said a little well, bit. Well, and um, even global. I mean, baseball started in America. Yep. It's very much spread to Asia, to Latin America. So That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's not just the United States. Um, Charlotte says, I love baseball. One of the many reasons why I love Cisco. There are so many reasons why we all love Cisco. I especially love that in uh, Take Me Out to the Holodeck, <laughs> he's seen wearing a San Francisco Giants hat. Go Giants. Um, I, as a Bay Area guy, I, I support that. Uh, Giants and A's, equal equal opportunity fan there. Um, yeah, it, it's a, it is that rare connection to uh, to something that we have right now. And Larry, I love the moment where uh, uh, Ducat sees the baseball there. You know, and then I love <laughs> when Cisco gets it back. That whole arc. Um, oh, it's so good! It's so good. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I, you know, I didn't think about it at the time, but the idea that they um, that they built into it, and again, it started uh, it's it started uh, before Michael's time, but the thread they picked up on about how baseball had become extinct, almost mm. nearly, you know, was just one of yes. these lost things, and how and how they're on a a two man band here now or an eight man band, but but apparently not because it wasn't completely extinct because a whole Vulcan crew was playing it that bopped into. Well, those you know, Vulcans can. I think they picked up the game pretty quickly. I think the, the, uh, I, the they read the rules. Side of it, yes. Yeah. 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 Maybe not the heart. Um, that I think that's the, sort of beyond logic. The pillar revival of baseball started right off the bat with his first show or two when he was had come to the show. But it's part of uh, is it evolution where it's got where Paul Stubbs is trying to the scientist is trying to launch his his uh, satellite to study uh, different anomalies and and uh, he launches into a whole soliloquy about the he, how he loved doing baseball statistics in his head since he was a kid. And it was like, oh, here's baseball back full bore. And then, you know, it that picked up. Well, uh, and then yeah. um, Tim says uh, the episodes uh, that episode spent, uh, sends me to sleep, much like baseball. So yeah, not everyone, <laughs> not everyone's a fan of that. But maybe we should switch to another captain's thing my, stuff. My greatest memory of baseball is watching all my uncles fall asleep on Saturday afternoons at family get together <laughs> <laughs> in the hot summer on a bus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is perfect. Um, let's switch to another captain. So um, Captain Picard's flute. Um, this beautiful image here of the captain in his in his gray uh, top, in his gray mm-hmm. Starfleet uh, uniform here playing the flute. And so this, this is a direct link to, uh, I was about to say, I did it. I was about to say tapestry, um, but I did <laughs> not. Um, the other... Super amazing, ridiculously awesome Picard episode, uh, the Inner Light. Mm-hmm. And so here, I'm glad we had two. Yeah, yeah, only two, only, only two. two. Yeah, uh, well, it's not the- like it's it's not like you know he has an episode that's about Starship Mine or anything like that. Right, um, right, right. Or yeah. too bad he never got a movie. Um, yeah. But here's the thing about the, and you mentioned the flute right off, but it got, this is a little bit kind of like pets, only a okay. slightly different sliver of this about love of stuff. It's not just that he said, oh, it's a flute, and I love that flute, and let me try to play on it. I mean, that flute to him is the one surviving uh, memory of this very real life he lived for 40, 50, 60 years yeah. in this fake, you know, it was a false, it was a memory from a memorial stone or whatever. I mean, uh, you know, a source of a, of a dead planet, but it was this very real that he felt like he lived 60 virtual years, just like O'Brien in the prison for you know, like name a series. They've done this, this plot, yeah. but um, it's, it's so it, to me, the flute is more than just, Oh, the flute, the flute is like his emotional touchstone to this. And it, plus he learned a skill that he didn't have before. So there's that, but it's almost like how his life changed, even though it was a fake life. Well, so to me, it's just more it's more way more resonant because in that same image you had up there. Can you pop it back just for a yeah. second? Yeah, yeah. The thing when I think of Picard and stuff, I think of Picard and the Mintakan tapestry, which he had at, over draped, which is in that picture, too, draped on his chair. This is his quarters. Right. Not right. the ready. But even in the ready room, you've got you've got the Shakespeare collection book. 
You've got uh, later on, you've got the Curlin Nascos after Dr. Galen gives it to him. And yeah, he salvages it apparently from the wreck of the D. I mean, Picard, once you get to it, is one of those, like I said before, he's got the RHIP, the rank has his privilege of being able to put things on display in his ready room. But even in his quarters where we are here, that's where the tapestry is. And he's got some things in his quarters that are even more maybe personal than just, oh, here's some professional things on display. But anyway, it's a it's another chance to show love of stuff, but the love can come from vastly different places, I'm saying. Yeah, and it's um if we look at the flute, it's not just his only connection to this life that he lived, but I always assume that flute belonged to someone and potentially the scientist that um that his uh his experience might have been based on. Um, yeah, he lived out this whole experience in, you know, in a, in a blink of an eye, basically. Well, it was more than a blink of an eye. He was out for a few minutes. Yeah. Um, 47 but, blinks. Yeah, 47. I always, um, I always assumed the life that he lived was based on someone, um, or an amalgamation of people, uh, mm. or whoever pr- uh, programmed that probe to, to go out, put that flute, like some, that, that flute belonged to someone in that civilization and now it's gone so it's also picard's not only the only connection he has to that whole experience but it's one of the last remaining connections to those people and in that sense larry it's um it's mm-hmm. priceless it's it's com- it's uh well, it, it's a completely irreplaceable priceless uh object and something that I never dawned on me until this second is it's all mental. It's all virtual in his mind, his whole experience yes. there. The fact that he's sitting there playing that in real life means he went down. And he, he, in his mind, he lived with that for decades, right? Yeah, yeah. But when he's revived and he's ex- had the experience, he had to have gone to a replicator and come up with a pattern and had that designed. That flute that he's playing, he had to have gone and had it designed and programmed. And had made you know whole in his real existence, right? So the 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 flute didn't come from the probe. It how wasn't... did he? How did he? Was it part of the probe? I've now I'm blank. I've never thought about this until just now. Somebody may know. I mean, the probe was an orbital thing, and yeah. then it gave him a you know connected to him via a a, a not, you know a beam, an energy connection, a link. I mean, how Kairos, did he basically get the flute? Kairos says uh, the flute was in the probe. Um, the okay. flute was in uh, the probe okay. all okay. along, folks. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, Scott okay, thank is... Thank you, uh, Kairos. I haven't... Um, I appreciate this show more for the fact that the whole world loves it. To me, the inner light is very intellectual. <laughs> I'm just going to say that if you ask me to name my <laughs> intellectual flight, next generation episode, what, what, if you ask me to name my top five, I mean, uh, the idea that inner light became this huge episode for people. I was like, okay, <laughs> uh, that's good. You, you, you go do that. So anyway, and, but I totally respect that. And it won a Hugo and blah, blah, blah. I get it. I'm just going to say that. Cause I'm honest. So, no, I have not sat and watched The Inner Light 4,700 different times, okay? Well, Larry, so. it is literally intellectual. Like, none none of that happens. It all is sort of in his mind. <laughs> what? What's the action of Inner Light? Well, they meet a probe, it connects with Picard, he collapses, and then after a little while, he gets up and goes on. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> they get real worried, but it turns out he's okay. Tate okay. says uh, it's too cerebral. Um, this episode. <laughs> Quick, recast that captain and get his initial wrong on the new show. Okay. Uh, we've got um, someone mentioned uh, his belongings in Star Trek Enterprise as well. Um, I think we've got a image of that. Um, no, that we have a different image from Star Trek Picard, but we see we see uh, Picard in. Um, is it the first episode, the second episode, where he goes to Starfleet Archives, he opens it up, he he kept, Larry, he kept the the Captain Picard's Day banner. Um, yes. So cute. He kept that. Um, uh, I'm a bit of a role model. Uh, and he donated it. That's, that's you know, he not only kept it, but then they yeah. donated or somebody else, maybe Deanna, you know, maybe Troy kept it for him, and then he goes, here! <laughs> you know. But it, yeah, we we see Picard, uh, Picard is um, 
you could say a little sentimental in this way that he does have these aspects of his journey as a Starfleet officer, um, as you were mentioning, the tapestry that that mm-hmm. is on his chair, um, the flute, um, these different uh, different belongings he he has. Um, he um, Picard is uh, you know he he's often criticized as being so intellectual. Um, he's also quite sentimental, um, as as we can see from mm-hmm. all of these objects. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I I meant I sort of said this as a joke, but um, I think it's it's worth discussing since we're in the realm of of captains. Let's talk about Janeway and mm-hmm. uh, her cup of Joe. Um, this specifically, they eventually in she you you look up images of Janeway and she's drinking you know dainty teacups and mugs and all kinds of things but she actually in canon said that this stainless steel was her favorite so you know it's kind this, of become this this specific of, mug in the, in this image that mm-hmm. she's holding is her favorite you know it looks like um it looks like a, a um a yeti mug um yeti's a brand that's uh kind of oh, popular okay. right now yeah it looks a lot like that i've i used to that that used to be my mug of choice now it's uh it's this one um command yellow from TOS um but um yeah this is a, this is coffee is stuff yeah. mug is stuff um, you, yeah, people I was, I was have saying, coffee is one thing, but then, that, but that mug, even you know, when you're talking Janeway, so yeah, 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 it is. Um, so we got a couple of layers there. So not only do people sometimes have a um a favorite mug, but um they might also have a very strong relationship with coffee or tea, and it symbolizes a lot of different things. So not only do mm-hmm. they might um really enjoy the experience of caffeine but also the rituals associated with it so our mm-hmm. our minds are association machines and um a mug a favorite mug or a cup of coffee yeah it might kind of get you going a little bit but um a, a coffee is it's a, an important part of a lot of people's rituals and um getting together for a cup of coffee might mean something or it might mean um, it might be a special time that you have just to yourself to to drink and enjoy something that you do by yourself. But mm. stuff is often related to rituals. Well, and again, I'm you know we were talking about pets, and I saw some agreement here. And I would never say a pet was the thing. That's not. That's this is more about coming from the big thing of love and the things we love, and then you know people, and then the things. But and then pets, they're like. But again, this is a case where it's like I'm thinking for today's topic, love of stuff. People love coffee. They have favorite foods. They have favorite music. They have favorite genres of entertainment, whatever. But to me, I'm talking about the physical things that we keep around us, that we collect, that are specific. You know, we might be a stamp collector, but we have a favorite stamp. I don't know. We have we collect our Star <laughs> Trek stuff. But we have our favorite Star Trek stuff right, thing. Right. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, to me, the day's topic is about things. So, to me, it wasn't about Janeway and her coffee. It was about Janeway and her mug. It wasn't about Cisco and baseball. It was about Cisco and the ball. <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> well, the, and, you know, it's like not only known to Cisco, but people that came into the office, into his office, knew about that ball. Alien invading powers knew about that ball. So that's what that's where I'm thinking our topic really is. It's about particular things, not just, you know, broad categories. Well, and I mean, Janeway specifically talks about um, about coffee in 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 Voyager. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, the finest organic um, suspension ever devised. I beat the Borg with it, as uh, as Cairo Mm -hmm. just said. Um, It's. If we coffee look at it. coffee and um, and there's a gosh, there is a lot of love for coffee and Ractaginos and tea in our comments section right now. But if we um, if we talk about um, coffee as food and as a, as a substance that people eat, um, one of the things that we see throughout Star Trek is um, is what food represents and a certain type of food and cuisine and drinks. And it is then often a connection to culture, to um, to your home, when people are very far away from home, whether it's, you know, a good, um, a, a good fresh supply of gach or um, 
And and what that might mean if you can eat live gach, you know, to Klingons is a little bit of all right, all right. You've got a little bit of honor, not too much, but you got you got a little bit more cred with me. Or for Janeway, um, it, it's not just that I think she was missing uh, when they're running low on coffee. It's not just that she needed the substance, but it's also that connection to that normal routine and ritual that she's had her whole life. You know, they've, they've lost everything out there in the Delta Quadrant. Um, you, you so need those little rituals that have always been a part of your life, as we all have experienced in 2020 and 2021. I hadn't thought. I just thought it was Janeway and her Kathy, ca- caffeine habit. So okay. <laughs> I didn't think about the emotional side. Uh, well, emotional, obviously. But, but yeah, no, if you've got Janeway and her ca- a caffeine coffee, you've got Picard and Earl Grey tea. You've got exactly. Yeah. Everybody <clears throat> on DS9 and Ractagino. You've got, uh, you know, you mentioned Worf and Gok. What about uh, Rom and Nog and the Ferengis and, you know, pre-chewed Gree Worms and all of that, you know, <laughs> all of that yeah. fun stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Beetle snuff. Um, all, <laughs> all of that kind of stuff. It's, it's, um, it's comforting to eat and drink the things that, that you love. And it's why, um, you know, uh, astronauts on the space station do sometimes request to have some small quantities of, of their favorite stuff. It's a little <laughs> connection to home when you don't have much else there to remind you of, of home. So, there's right. a lot there. Uh, tube grubs, as Cairo says. Uh, tube mm-hmm. grubs. Um, tube and grubs. of course, green, well, um, green worms were also a thing too. But yes, tube, gr- <laughs> tube grubs a, got more mentions. Larry, we could do a whole episode on food. We haven't thought about that yet. But as we could Charlotte reminds, on Ferengi food, and I'm sure Libby would love that. <laughs> um, uh, prune juice as well. Let's not forget <laughs> about prune juice, the warrior's drink. Um, but yeah, let's mm-hmm. uh, let's go into um, into a different direction. Um, um, you, uh, you outlined, uh, a few different episodes here. Well, you know, we are, we're, we've got some more to go down here and again, I'm flying blind. So, but you know, there was a guest star. Mm-hmm. I was almost done. And then mm-hmm. I went, Oh, that's right. There is a whole, we're not quite to the hoarding stage here. And I love everybody's comments here. Who <laughs> you, Scott said, who are you calling a hoarder? Because we're fans and we're collectors and <laughs> people have their collections. And some people have a bigger collection than other ones. And it's not about money. It's about <laughs> stocking every corner of your life with Star Trek, I guess. But we had an episode that was not so much about the hoarding aspect, but just the <clears throat> the uh, collecting. I don't want to say the the evils, the most toys with Kivas Vajo. Yes, yes. And it bled over into... You know, look again, it was another episode of looking at data as a thing, not a sentient being. But the fact that there are collectors out there and, you know, that that still exists and he has friends who come over and he lords it over or people that want to come. And, you know, the cultures that do have value currencies, so that there's a value associated with collectibles um, that that all still exists. And that's cool. And, you know, Jake and uh, Jake and, and well, Jake is chasing was a Jackie Robinson card for his dad in, in the cards yeah, on this nine. Yeah. So it's, it's a far fledged, you know, the idea of collecting and things having relative value and scarcity, and that's not replicated. It's a certificate of non-replication authenticity. <laughs> um, but here you've got it on the toxic end where it goes beyond just collecting power to you, to the fact that this guy turns, uh, you know, dangerous. Yeah. 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 I think the, um, there's a lot of great things in that episode. One is not seeing Data as a sentient life form who deserves uh, freedom, considering him an object, which has been, um, I mean, not only is that addressed well in Measure of Man, but that's um, that's a consistent problem in, with humanity when we have uh, not considered people. To it's be almost people. like they don't have a lot of respect for artificial intelligence and. Um... <laughs> that that's still a debatable, controversial issue. Hmm. They should <laughs> they should come back to that theme at some point. Yeah. Yeah, maybe they will in a future series on maybe, you know, even All Access. Like, I mean, I Paramount know. Plus. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe even uh, UPN. I mean, like, what about holograms, <laughs> for instance? What about that? <laughs> holograms. They should really be free, Larry. They should really yeah, be free. Yeah, yeah. Um, Charlotte says, oh, whenever oh, I oh. watch this episode, all I can think is, hey, it's Donnie from Frasier. <laughs> um and Scott says, I thought the reverse when I saw him as Donnie. Um, yeah, I think that episode, um, it gets into um, 
Warehouse a 13, little... anybody? Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I forgot about mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it gets into what, what can happen a little bit if we get um, too into collecting yeah. and um, don't really think about the consequences of, of that. And we just sort of uh, want the stuff and feel right. entitled to the stuff. Um, and absolutely. and don't have a don't have a good enough agent to get us a reality series. So you know. <laughs> um, moving, <clears throat> let's let's jump uh, way forward in linear time, which is actually a jump back in canon. That becomes a big jump forward in canon. Mm-hmm. And let's talk about Giorgio's telescope here, which um, is very poignant. And and to me, it's like that's an object that. It's like it means more to other people than it does to the original owner. Well, the original owner dies. Yeah. But uh, anyway, I was trying to think of things in Discovery in some of the newer shows, and that's the first thing that leaped to my mind there. So. Uh, yeah. Um. There's there's a lot of interesting things that we could do with this episode. So one is um, telescope and yes, uh, science and exploration. One of the first ways in which humans have ever had the ability to explore mm-hmm. space. So there's there's that meaning. But the other meaning here, um, the moment a person dies, their belongings change in value. They tend to skyrocket in value. And I don't just mean in a monetary sense. I also mean in the psychological sense. So um, if, if there's a celebrity or a famous leader, a, a president, someone who dies... The stuff that they've touched, we will pay more money for it. Or if we have a relative or someone we love and they've died, now they're the things that they held on to, um, they carry a lot more weight and significance for us. And they're mm-hmm. handled with much more care. So that's a, I see a little bit of that with Giorgio's telescope and how it is sort of passed on. Um, we barely had, as viewers, we barely ha- got to see Giorgio, um, and this crew served with her. So that <clears throat> telescope is this uh, one last connection that they all really have to her. Yes. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm actually trying to keep up with the chat this week, and everybody's, uh, and I'm behind, of course. But, uh, but yeah, but uh, so, I, you know, I... Um, there's so many times when partly because we've had so few episodes of the, of the newer series of the, <laughs> of the semi series, the secret hideout world. Um, but then I had one strike me just right off. One hit me right off from Picard. And it's the one that I, I even, I was so moved by it. I even did a multi-part panel for you. So let's explore that. I mean, bring this image, uh, up right here. Yeah. So this is um, Rios's stuff. Rios, and you know, it's. And I started thinking about lockers. I I thought about Jack Crusher's locker that they they find and give to Jack to to Wesley, right, with a few yeah. things in it. But Rios is such a. We talk about you know, in Tom Paris, I almost pulled something of Tom Paris trying to work. So much of what he had was actually how it. You know, we're talking about love of stuff, and we're and when we're talking about interests, you know, like. Tom was in a prison, then he came on a, a short-term ship that was going to go hunt some spies. <laughs> so it's not like he had things of his own. So everything he had is like it's replicated. It's, you know, he he's a grease monkey, but all of his cars are holographic cars, aside from the pickup that they find in the, you know. So it's not like we think about Paris having stuff, but he had interests. Well, um, here's a case where anytime we get into somebody's footlocker, or they're, especially if they're not in Starfleet anymore, or they're, they've passed. It's interesting. And in Picard, Rios, who has issues like everybody else in the show, goes and pulls out his locker. And so it's like, what is in this guy who's left Starfleet out of some trauma or tragedy? What did he decide to keep with him? Even if it's tucked away in his foot locker and not out on display, you know, with his um, tragically philosophical books that he's always reading. And it's and I had forgotten when you go and look at those things. He's got it's like he has his com badge and some of his pips, okay? And he's got like and he's got like an like a uridium patch that in the 23rd century held up your monster maroon uniform. That's that one that circle there is like what is he one of those for? But he's got when he opens his locker, he's got it looks like it's vinyl like 33 to 3rd vinyl long play albums. 
I guess they made yeah, yeah. I guess Vinyl made yet another comeback. (laughs) (laughs) But he's got his uniform in there, and he fishes out. He fishes out. He's got some books in there, you know. And he's and he's got the 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 main point of this is he goes because he stuck away the picture of what little flower who was another uh, another version of wasn't exactly the Alice or the Maisie series, but it was the Sophie series, the Dodge series, (laughs) and that's the that's the upshoot of that series. But it was like. Here's a troubled guy who left Starfleet, and he put stuff in his locker that it was too painful to look at, but he kept it for some reason, right? Yeah, that whole, yeah. I, I really I, came back to an appreciation of that whole sequence. I, I think it's you know, it's telling that um, his stuff is locked away, and it, it, it that he held on to it, that he's kept it, and he's kept it locked away. Um, oftentimes, when we we go through a difficult loss. One of the things we might do is temporarily put away those things that remind us of that difficult loss. And mm-hmm. if we've gone through traumatic events, we might do the same kind of thing. And I think we see that with uh, Rios, that these these memories are very... These objects are meaningful for that part of his identity, but that part of his identity is put away right now, and that's done very mm-hmm. intentionally. Um, Charlotte mentioned something that I just <laughs> we have to talk about here. Are we not going to talk about how the Ferengi auction off pieces of their body after they die? So speaking of stuff and speaking of stuff that was related to someone who's died and it increases in value, the Ferengi in their <laughs> ever capitalistic wisdom yep. <laughs> have found a way to monetize that. Larry, See, the, the um, Ferengi were worshiping prophets way before the Bajorans were, <laughs> which is the pun that gets used in the Voyager title. But yeah, uh, I, I had not thought about that, but that's a good one. Yes, indeed, that's yeah. a real good one. Yeah, yeah, and I mean there are um, there's there's some connection to our world. We don't auction off um, vacuum sealed uh, discs of people who have died. We don't do that, but. Um, Sometimes if, if you cremate someone, you might um, you might keep some of their ashes in your home. Um, uh, also, the, the site of where someone has been buried or where their ashes were spread, um, that increases in, in kind of um, value and importance in your life. So we don't quite do what the Ferengi do, but we um, there's, a, there's some connection to our, our real world life here. I just said, um, let's not do what the Ferengi do, or something just flashed through my mind. Like, <laughs> okay, let's all do. What the, yeah, let's let's not. Um, and I'm I'm scrolling back through here, and one that one that I thought of that I didn't know about getting back into it because we, what's f- on the production side, on the practical side of things, and again, this is not a K three that I did for today. It, it I I uh, blinked on it briefly in uh, several ways, but a lot of what we're thinking here. And here's the example. Tate mentioned this at one point that Kirk, apparently as he got older, especially, but in even the original series, we see things in we're in McCoy's quarters once, but we're in Kirk's and Spock's quarters many times. And we see, you know, those iconic things. And now when James did the sets up in New York and when Vic did the sets, it continues. Everybody goes to a lot of trouble to exactly replicate, you know, that that open sculptured ancient warrior head and the little markers and Spock's little incense burning thing from that you see in a muck time, especially, but there are things in even Kirk and Spock's quarters in the original series when they had no budget. Right. And Scotty has the kilt up matted and framed on his wall and some things that, that string heart or whatever. Um, they had some things even on a sixties budget, but a lot of that we don't really see. We have no relevance to. We we have no resonance with it because it was never part of a plot. But it, we remember it because it was the set dressing. And in that case, it's not yeah. so much the writers, but it's like the set decorators consulting with. And I don't know. I would say that the baseball started off that way. I now I'm curious to see if there was a baseball on Cisco's desk before it was used as something in the show. Because you know what happens? They put the they put the Shakespeare book in the ready room. And then eight or ten shows in, it becomes an object when Q picks it up and starts quoting from it, right? And then they had the tug of war with the book, almost like Cisco's baseball is a tug of war item later with, with Cisco. 
And it's like the decisions that set decorators make that some appro- some producer is going to approve that, right? There are a lot of things that we think of as key in in a in somebody's like public place, like I said, like their office. And we see that a lot as a fan watching a show over and over. And even if the character never references it, we think it's important. We just don't know why. So on a practical side, it's like the set decorator. You know, eventually they started playing with Livingston the fish, even though very famously <laughs> talking about pets. I'm probably blowing all kinds of K3s today that I could use later. But, you know, very famously, they had a, a Livingston tank on the E. And the first time they walked through the sets, this being a movie and this being the dynamic was different. Sir Patrick said, you know what? I really never did like the fish tank. And I really don't <laughs> think I really don't think Picard would be someone who kept living things. So the fish tank mm. went away. But there was a fish tank. John Dwyer had a fish tank uh, ready to go for the Picard ready room of the E. And uh, Patrick asked that it be taken out. And they took it out. Picard but wouldn't be is, someone who keeps living things. I don't think he would keep a fish, but he would keep a dog. I see that in character. Really, you want to go there? You want to, you want to supposition that out that far? Uh, no, no. I kind of would. Would I want to? Um, I, um, I Charlotte brought another great example um, here. That um, oh, 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 oh. So my point was. Trying oh, to you got a point. I, oh, okay. I actually go ahead. got a point from <laughs> what Tate said earlier. Was that as the movies got into it and as people had budgets. We didn't really have an emotional connection to it, except barely. And aside from one line in Wrath of Khan, was when McCoy said, "You know, get out of here before you're as old as your collection." But Kirk oh, yeah, did yeah. have a lot of antiquities, you know, a lot of nautical stuff. But even in Generations, his cabin, he's got Batlas on the wall. He's got a painting of the Enterprise. He's got all kinds of things hanging in his wherever his quarters tend to be, whether it's his apartment in San Francisco earlier. Or his cabin that we get the flashback in generation. So yeah, Kirk, as he got, especially as he got older, was a fan of antiquities and and yeah. rustic things. And a lot of times they had to do the glasses with, McCoy gave him. Uh, well, then, McCoy gave him those. Ended right. up in San Francisco in the past, which were practical. Don't forget, they were actually yeah, to his. They were they were practical. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because um, he's allergic to uh, what was that medication? Well, or? he ret retinax, but McCoy says, yeah. or they say red knives or something bizarre, and it's bizarre. Anyway, <laughs> um, um, but yeah, sure. but, so I did see that. But I'm, what I'm saying is, a lot of times we as fans associate things with characters, and we never heard them talk about them or discuss them because they were just like in a practical sense they were set dressing, but they were there. Yep. You know, especially the further back. Yeah. Uh, there's a, a great comment from Charlotte that I wanted to highlight. Um, they use things as evidence when Data's sentience is on trial. The book yep. Picard gave him, yep. the wars he yep. won as a Starfleet officer, the desktop hollow of Tasha Yar. It's almost like we equate our relationship with things with our very sentience or worth. Charlotte, that's a that's a really great point because mm-hmm. he, he doesn't keep those for um, logical uh, reasons. He keeps them very much for emotional reasons. They're, um, and that's, uh, that's Which what was the point. Which yeah. was, ex- yeah, exactly the point. Um, and I think that point really hits home. And it, it's, it's such a, uh, it's, it's such a, a, a sentience. I was going to say a human thing, but it's such a sentient thing um, to do that. So, um, Oh, I just Scott's- see a comment here from Nathaniel. We were talking about Cisco's baseball. He says the baseball was lost. It was supposed to have been saved for Avery, but it was gone. According mm. to ISB, I'm going to venture that it was not lost. <laughs> I'm going to venture that as it Larry not pulls it out right now. <laughs> <laughs> I have a couple of things, but it's not. Else no, I'm just going to say that I think very few things were lost from yeah, Star Trek. If yeah, they, if they disappeared, be. that's one thing. But yeah, yeah. Um, Scott's asking about my different cam- camera angle. Scott, the, the bridge is still there. Don't worry. The, the concept art is still there. I'm just, uh, trying out a little bit different setup, uh, this week. Um, oh, Larry, I wanted to mention you, you brought up, um, Freeman's ready room as an example. Um, yes. well, I there, said the thing we haven't got yep, to yet. I'm putting, I'm putting case. it up right now from lower decks. Not any spoilers here, so don't worry, folks. See, but the thing here about we see- lower decks is they get to be met. Their whole point of the show, half of the point of the show, is to be meta about all the other Star Treks. So it's right, like anything right. we talk about in any other series winds up in some. It winds up on on lower decks. Yeah. 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 
Um, and so we see a bunch of stuff right there. We see the sextant. We see every captain seems to have a model I of their ship. It's like Pike's little weird hat that we saw in. <laughs> yes. You know, the whole excuse for everything in the JJ, everybody wearing their little Nazi helmet hats or hats and you know, cadets and officers for their dress uniforms in the JJ, in the Kelvin verse. It's like all the justification comes in the fact that Pike had a hat when you never saw hats in Star Trek before, <laughs> especially officer hats. Yeah. Um, Huge that, communist Chinese hats or some North Korean hats with the front end. Yeah, I I like um I like that moment. Um, but my favorite moment of stuff of love of stuff for, um it one of them is from Lower Decks and it is that um approach to Starbase dock scene where <laughs> you just. Oh. <laughs> you have the they're uh, they're in the shuttlecraft they're approaching um they're approaching the cerritos and uh there's it, it's just every starship dock approach sequence like every cliche the multiple takes the music it's very wrath of khan a little motion picture in there a little generation like it's it's all of them and then then all of a sudden there's um the blinking, uh, not the blinking lights, the um, the lens flares um, from the JJ films. And then, like, they're just like, wow, so beautiful. It's so much like the motion picture scene. And then I think the engineer starts crying. <laughs> he's just like, he's just sobbing so much. It's, it's like a minute long. <laughs> I love that seed so much. I uh, when I first saw it, I, I had to stop because I was laughing so hard, and then I rewound it and watched it again. I had so much fun with that scene. But um, and we the have, relevance is the relevance is um, the relevance is we we haven't really talked about um, people's relationships with vessels, um, and I'm not talking about the nuclear kind. I'm talking about the dilithium guy the- here. Or the blood kind, yes. Yeah, we haven't talked about people's uh, relationships to their starships, to the Enterprise, the Defiant, um, whatever the ship might be, or stations. Um, And the parallel here that um, we have with uh, vehicles, whether it might be one of your first vehicles, which probably might have been a bicycle. Um, I had a very strong emotional connection to my bicycle. Uh, It was... It represented independence for me and joy and fun and something I learned how to do myself. And I fell down, but I got back up. I learned how to keep going. My bike represents that first bike. And and anytime I get on a bike, it brings back some of those feelings of just the joys of going fast. But for a lot of us, um, cars might represent this. Um, I know the very first car I had when I was uh, a teenager, it was a piece of crap. But uh, it it still represented independence for me. Um, other vehicles, if if people own other vehicles, um, uh, in in Star Trek, well, we, um, home. a lot of people name their vehicles, right? A lot of people name their vehicles. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, in Star Trek, they um, uh, it's off, especially in the older series, it's. Uh, um, the Enterprise is a uh, is gendered. It's a uh, her. It's almost like a um, engineers will refer to her as almost like a person. So um, our um, and 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 that was the other thing. Yeah, as a ho- it, these things can also represent homes, which some people have that relationship with their home, mm-hmm. whatever mm-hmm. your home might be. It it you you might love it. It might it brings a, a ton of different emotions up. But yeah, like um, all I think we see this with all the engineers in um, in Star Trek. They all love their ships. Even a love hate like O'Brien and DS Nine. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, that's true. Yeah, my you had people, Glenn. That was on purpose. That what? was that. Uh, Glenn says, "Wait, did Ali just say nuclear instead of nuclear?" Um, yes, that was that was uh, supposedly on purpose. I just, no, I'm sorry, Larry. You were... naming, yeah. No, I, I, uh, you were talking about your first car or two were, were a piece of crap. Mine were always oh, yeah. like family hand downs. So I had like the family, you know, like so. Uh, but yeah, I had, I had. Um, it's funny. I remember the, like the third car I owned. I kept trying to come up with a name for it. It just wasn't there. 
so I quit trying. <laughs> <laughs> but the first two had kind of like nicknames. So it's just, you know, you got older and after a while it wasn't quite the big thing. But um, anyway, I'm just going back. I'm trying to keep up. I'm, I've, the last couple of weeks I haven't been great about keeping up with the chat. I'm just trying to – and everybody's been so great. Uh, are we – Are we? where are we? Are we about done? Do we need to move into uh, – um let me what's check that, what's that my... other thing we do in the show uh, yeah we do we do a lot um let me just check my notes here um oh there's one more thing i wanted to talk about um the sword of Kalos. Hmm. so um one thing we haven't yet talked about um in detail so much is um how objects can also take on um a sacred uh value a sacred mm. meaning and it's it doesn't have to be religious. It can be like a family heirloom, or it could be um, it, it could be objects like uh, uh, a cultural, object. a cultural. Yeah, it could something that um, that feels um, like it is. It, it it's it's very important. Um, it's its value is not in in the monetary but it's it's uh, value is much more in the psychological and when when things are sanctified in that way we treat them very differently mm -hmm. we might uh, cover them up and keep them safe and keep them away so that they aren't uh, ruined or we might put them on some kind of literal pedestal we might raise them up and um, um, the sword of Kalis is an example of this. It's um, it's believed to um, that the sword that Kalis uh, wielded is believed to have these uh, these powers, and it's it's sort of uh, uh, when when War finally finds it, it um, it drives uh, it, it drives a wedge between him and uh, who's he? Is it with the clone of Kalis that he's? Um, that he is on that trip to find the sword of Kalos? I can't remember. No, now. it's Kor. It's Kor. Yeah, right, yeah, right, right. Yeah. Kor, he's he's with Kor. Can I just can I just laugh here because you're the Niner guy and I'm just spinning through the, the chat here where about forty seven different people said, Larry, the flute was on the probe. And so thank you, all forty seven <laughs> of you. But um, the fact that you didn't remember that it was Kor that it not no, Kalos Kalos had Batlas. There's but they only yeah. Kalos was only in, Kevin Sullivan was only in one show because they didn't like the casting. So, yes, it was oh. only, it was not, it was not, <laughs> that's why we never saw Kalos again as a living person, um, um. In holographic or other, or cloned or otherwise. But yeah, it was Kor. Yeah, that makes sense. Because only Kor can go, his eyes can light up. So, um, know, yeah, yeah. Sword, I think yeah. that's a, a prerequisite to play Klingon in the, in the motion picture on. You have to be able to do the eyes um yeah i mean i wanted to bring up and my to say the, vegetable yes yeah the closest to um you you have a ton of these in your um in your space larry the closest i have to a sacred star trek object is this thing right here i don't know, I don't have a ton. If my camera oh man my camera is that a film something. clip oh you got a film it clip. is yeah 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 I, the, because it's see-through um it's so my camera is not it's, liking. Yeah. <laughs> it's not liking it. But it's um this I got from Rod Roddenberry and it's it a, is it's um, a head. Yeah. It's um it's uh, a, a film clip uh, from the original series. It is uh, of Spock. Um, mm. uh, and what it says here is this authentic film clip features an outtake from the original series production of Star Trek. Um, and yeah, I. Love this thing. It's a I headshot, cherish. right? It's a close up. Yeah, it's a close up of Spock, which you yeah, can't well, it, you can't see because it's a good. it's a film negative. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, that's the closest I have, and it's I know that that was from a camera that was on the set um, during the original production, um, and it is of Spock. I mean. Come on, can you can you get more meaningful to me? Um, but I know you've got I know you've got something that's probably gonna top me here. Oh no no no! This is when they were cleaning out boxes in the eighties, going back in for when Richard Arnold got his jo paid job, and he took this brought this to a con. You can see the wood grain in it. Anyway, this is an original series microtape. That's the only thing I have of the original series, actually. Oh. But 
Um, oh, cool. Well, it's the original series. I mean, everything's gone or broken. But I took the first time we filmed uh, – I brought this with me, the first episode we filmed of uh, Continues. And as we got ready to start on the first day, the first day of the first shoot, I uh, brought this along and made a little thing and said, hey, we're – you know, here's a little piece of the original series to bless us or whatever. But yeah, it's exactly what you're talking about, the reverence that we – that People we, were uh, telling me, um, Larry, that I should put a piece of paper behind it. So that's a very good idea. That's thank you for that suggestion. Maybe this. See now it's so reflective. Now a, you're it's, seeing Larry. It's a, it's a matter. It's really a matter of the focus. It's the focal length. Yeah, it helps a little bit. It's, yeah. It's really uh, my show it's and not tell. To, yeah. Oh oh oh! We got Find so it. close. There it is. There it is. You can kind of see it now. Part of that's um, the plastic. Yeah. Yeah, so there you go, folks. That is my uh, original. Some that's my guy piece with, of the uh, bangs and a blue shirt. Yeah, he's got devil ears, Larry. He's got uh, he's got devil ears. That's oh, my great, little piece great. of. Now um... the South won't carry us. Great. <laughs> yeah, I know. We've lost lost support life in the South. We've lost Birmingham. Um... Oh no. <laughs> um, Larry, should we venture yes. forward, my friend? Um, yes, we should. Yes, let's let's do that. So. Um, Let's uh, enter the counselor's log. This is the part of the show when I do a little bit of a deeper dive into um, some of the psychology behind the stuff we're talking about. And Larry, there is so much stuff I could say about stuff. Um, I was doing my... um, That's not what you did there. Yeah. (laughs) There's so much... uh, Oh, Nathaniel. (laughs) Nathaniel just said therapy in mariner's voice ah <laughs> thank you for that that y'all uh, I forgot about that or moment. in scotty's voice i do not need a psychologist a psychiatrist i think he said yeah i remember I that a <laughs> oh what a great episode uh that was um the, yeah, I was thinking about this last night as I was kind of prepping for this, and there there's so many things I could say. Um, we we show a uh, we show that uh, an understanding of our own stuff at a very young age. There's this thing called the endowment effect, where um, young kids, as as young as uh, two to four, they value their own things more than other people's things. And they get envious and jealous of other people's things as well. Mine. Mine. Yes, yes. yes. And they often think that um, (laughs) if they're the first one to grab it, it means it's theirs um, and that they own it. So um, even if they don't really like it, they will will protect their own stuff. So when my daughter was um, around a year old um, and she was in daycare – her teacher sh- shared this story with us that was just uh, cracked me up. We we're trying to get her to eat eggs because eggs are so easy to make <clears throat> and they're nutritious and you can just kind of give them to her. So for her lunch, we gave her some eggs and she hated her eggs. Um, she never ate them. We always got them back uneaten. Um, but um, she knew they were hers. And another boy in the class loved eggs. He had eggs for his lunch. He ate them all. He saw Nora's eggs and started uh, kind of like crawling to Nora, uh, my daughter. And then um, she, um, my daughter saw this happening. She <laughs> ate, she put the egg in her mouth, held on to it in her mouth when, when the boy was there. And then when he left, she kind of spit it all out again. She never uh-huh. ate it. But she knew they were hers, and she didn't want anyone else to to have any. So Pride going for a preference or something. I don't know. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> um, but we, um, even as a from a young age, uh, kids um, kids know what's theirs and what's not theirs, and they they want their own thing. Um, and as as kids get a little bit older, and their parents might be uh, training them to kind of sleep on their own. Uh, they might have things that we call a transitional object, which is uh, like a stuffed animal or something that helps them calm themselves down because they don't Kukulaka. have their... yeah, yeah. <laughs> they don't have their parent to kind of soothe them Somebody and calm mentioned. them down, yeah. and so they might have their own object to kind of soothe them. We call those transitional objects, 
And then when we're teenagers, our objects become a way of expressing our identity, our cl clothing. Um, we talked a little bit with Rios. Um, clothing is a way of expressing identity, and that becomes really important for for um, teenagers as um, as well. So um, when it comes to stuff, it, you know, their stuff is often used as a tool. St stuff gets us helps us to get things done. Stuff is about safety and security, but the the things that we hold on to, the things that we ch cherish, it, they're things that reflect our identity. They communicate what tribe we're in. Um, if we go back to uh, ancient times, clothing, objects was a huge way of expressing, I'm in this tribe. I'm a <laughs> part of these people. We are all together. Um, and when you're wearing a Star Trek shirt, I was going to say, have you been to a convention or any sporting? <laughs> the sports. Well, yeah, yeah. I, that's ex the exact <laughs> parallel I was going to make. Um, we last week was the Super Bowl. Uh, if anyone watched it, I didn't watch it because my daughter was. She insisted that we watch Sesame Street instead. Um, but <laughs> sports. Oh, and the impeachment. It's really funny watching all those senators wearing red or blue T-shirts. It's really funny. Uh, uh, yes, there's that too. We're not um, quite there yet, but yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's, um, it's a way of expressing what tribe you're in, what you support, your ideals, um, all of that sort of stuff. So there's a lot of communication Basically. that happens, um, that happens with stuff. Um, and then the other thing that, that happens here, I think we, you were talking this about with the captains, especially with Picard is, um, Stuff is not only about expressing identity, but it's also about holding on to memories. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we find this as people get older, they tend to have more things from different parts of their lives. And people in the later states of their life will talk about, you know, I walk through my home and I'm reminded of all of these things from my life. And stuff is a way of... Um, of, of reminding us of these important moments in our life, which we've seen with all the captains, that um, that's, that's exactly what, what people do. Is, uh, it's, it, it is nostalgia in, in the way that nostalgia was meant to remind us of important relationships and important moments in our life. And, and as people get older, they still have a fondness <clears throat> for the brands and the things from their mm -hmm. childhood. They still try to find those old brands and it can be it can be a big problem when um, when they don't have access to those old brands that they might be used to. You mentioned hoarding a little bit earlier, Larry. So I just wanted to well, say as an extreme, yeah, an unhealthy as extreme. an extreme, yeah, yeah. So what happens with hoarding? Um, hoarding is um, uh, what we call the uh, part of the OC spectrum of uh, of mental health problems. The OC spectrum referring to obsessive compulsive related problems. The um, the thing with hoarding is you'll see this with with people whose home um, gets filled up with with a lot of stuff to the point where it's really unsafe. Um, people not only acquire more, they have a hard time getting rid of things, and the reason for that is they have a very strong emotional attachment to things, and they have a hard time letting these things go feels almost like they will lose every single memory um, associated with it. There's a, um, it, it's a little, uh, they have a little bit, uh, a lot of bit, I should say, difficulty in letting go of the thing because it's this massive fear that they're going to, um, there's going to be a great loss associated with it. With, with you know, little paper clippings and um, small objects. Um, we're not talking about precious, important objects. We're talking about everyday <laughs> things, like often things that a lot of people would mm -hmm. consider trash and garbage. So we think it's a very biologically based problem. And it has um, it's a problem in um, the frontal lobe and amygdala, the connection between the more logical and the more emotional part of your brain. But yeah, it's a serious condition, and it can lead to um, it, it can lead to a lot of um, injury because of how, f how big your home gets, how full it gets, and it, it leads to a lot of problems in relationships. So that's on the extreme side of things. But um, this is uh, this is the stuff of stuff, and I'll talk a little bit more about collecting mm. and all of that um, as we get to the away mission. But um, yeah, that is stuff. We have talked about stuff. Um, 
Well, and, uh, you know, I'm I'm catching up in the chat here. Here's a couple more. Uh, Heidi is saying, how about Saru keeping the flowers? I've gone yeah. blank on their name from his home flowers from Kaminar. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Growing in his, you know, that's organic, but still um, talking about the emotion. You know what? And something else, the, the whole thing about Ready Room and it's another RHIP. People have things in their quarters but but uh, captains and captains have quarters and they can be personal there too. But the ready room is like a rare chance for an office that that well you know ambassadors and dignitaries and troubled crew members. When you get a chance to go into a ready room of a captain and it's big enough, it's pretentious enough, like the the galaxy classes and Picards, you're presenting. You know, it's like you made choices about what to put out. So if you walk into the office and go, oh. And Picard is choosing to let people think he's a slice of a fossilized tree rock or something. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> you know, or or that fossilized shell and that that crustacean, whatever it is, but that mollusk. But or the Shakespeare book, or the Curl and Nascos, or the the crystal ship model that was in his office for a while. But it's like it's not just about you're keeping it for you. To some point, it's like what are you presenting of yourself to the outside world? Yeah. And, or Cisco, like the, you know, Cisco had the, besides the baseball, for, don't forget, Cisco had, and Picard did too, Cisco had ship models, right? Yep. Yep. Uh, Archer had old Enterprise drawings. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so. Doesn't, um, um, uh, oh no, speaking of s- ship models, I was thinking of early Next Generation. Uh, they hadn't quite. They they assumed that um, the reason why we see a Constitution class ship um, in his quarters is uh, the they weren't yet sure what the Stargazer, what class would it be. They kind of made that assumption that it was a Constitution class ship, and then later when they actually built out the model for it, they changed what the model mm-hmm. was in his ready room. But it was originally a Constitution class ship, wasn't it? Like this gold uh-huh. color. Well, it was yellowish. They built the they built the one to be, have it be a constitution class, except constellation class. Except they uh, constellation or const- which, which one did I say? You're I say? you're thinking that there's a bit where they have Jordy say something about constellation constitution class, and then they redub it to say constellation class. There's that too. I for, uh, yeah yeah. For, <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting I'm getting both. But how about, how about Jordy's old captain sending him a sailing model of the oh, namesake yeah. Yeah, of yeah. their yeah. I can yeah. I can remember the captain's name was Lombada, but I can't remember the which one uh, the Victory was that what it was? That sounds anyway. right. In, um, anyway, um, I'm totally what not, when, I'm totally. One comment I want to share before we get into the K3 factors from Rebecca. Rebecca says, I still have my doll from when I was a baby. I took her to college and on any long trips away from home. She moved to the UK with me. And last time I was unexpectedly in the hospital overnight, uh, Tim brought her to me to comfort me. I love that story, Rebecca. And I think we all um, we all have these items that have kind of been with us and provide us with comfort. And increasingly, um, those are becoming digital items as well. Um, especially um, digital ways of expressing your identity, digital stuff that we can collect, photos. Like selfies are a big part of that. Um, Selfies are a way of sharing you in this time and in this moment as a way of expressing part of your identity but also holding on to the memory. So um, a lot of us have that stuff, and increasingly that stuff is becoming uh, much more digital. Um, So... um, yeah, it's fun you you said this because I I like I didn't think about this for years, but uh, like the stuff that I there are a lot of things that I gave when I left home. I had certain things that were at my ha- you know, and my dad had our house for ages, and when we until he died, and we were going through to clean it out, and there and stuff I knew was there, but it really is now. I'm thinking about it even more than this was ten eleven years ago. Oops, almost twelve years ago now, but. Going through the house, the things that I just knew were there that I had the comfort. Well, if I ever want to see this again or there, it's sitting there. Well, now it won't be. And are making hard decisions about what to keep and what not to. And some things I by then we had, you know, digital whatever. And I was taking pictures. Some things like I can't keep everything, but I'm taking pictures of it. But it struck me, I like all three of my two brothers, all of our teddy bears were stuck. But we didn't take them with us, you know. Because we're, you know, all grown ass men now or whatever. But it's like, well, I can't let my teddy bear be thrown away. So it's like of all the things 
you know, whatever. Like, so now I have my teddy bear stuck back here only because <laughs> we had to clean out my dad's. And it seemed like sacrilege to like cutting down a tree or something. It's like, right. I had to take my teddy bear. I'll show my grandkids that this was my, you know, when they get old enough to appreciate, but it's just, it's weird how we, um, yeah, it struck me that that's kind of like it. In that moment, it was like, well, that's like going and just gratuitously cutting down a tree. It's like, I'm not going to throw away a teddy bear, mine or anybody right. else's. Right. You right. Know? Because it, it has that, um, it's become this more uh, priceless thing. It's not just this yeah. thing you, you get yeah. rid of. Yeah. Uh, Larry, let's jump into the K3 oh, factor. Oh, okay. Well, so as opposed to all the wonderful tidbits of advice uh, that uh, an insight that Dr. Ali is giving you K3, named for the one aspect that we can find in the original series of mental health, <laughs> from Dr. McCoy's biobed monitor there, before they called them biobeds. It was just the sick bay bed monitor thing. Um, but this week's K3, where we do a deep dive, my end, my expertise end is doing a deep dive into the behind the scenes part of Star Trek, but still with this theme today, love of stuff. So this is really a fun one because there are a lot of different ways I could go. In fact, when I started thinking about it, there was a lot of meta on some of these episodes and moments and set decorators and all of that that I could have gone to. But what I went to instead was the creators behind the show as people who have a love of stuff. And I, it struck me that there's a recurring theme here. And it may even be generational because we're talking about people's offices and what they have with them to show visitors – but right. in a creative in a creative place, what people feel like they want around to surround themselves with if they're a creative and I, what gets their creative juices going. And when you especially now post 90s, if you visit a lot of different kinds of creatives offices, say in Hollywood, you're I don't know. I can't see what you're showing up, but you can basically put these up in any order. But okay. just in the times when people I've interviewed over the years um, I don't even know what the order is, but Putting like up, I've, um, uh, Ryan uh, Fuller. Yeah. So here's baby Brian Fuller and you could see, and this was the nineties on Voyager. <laughs> this is like his second year, like his second year of his first professional job. But like, you can see he's got, he's got the alien. I'm going on memory here. He's got the alien up there. He's got uh, Picard Locutus. A, he's, yeah. he's got another, he's got something else down below. I forget another there's franchise. A stormtrooper. There's a yeah. Vader. Yeah. So he's got that, but then you come a few f ten years later. We've got uh, Mike Sussman. I've got David Goodman. Yeah, I'm gonna look at what, Sussman's yeah. desk. So he's got um, an Andorian here, um, an original series Andorian. Yeah, um, he's, he's got, got the that's NX01. Just a tiny window. Yep, I couldn't yeah. find my original. That's my photography. I couldn't find the original picture, but I've got that in the magazine. I, I've had that same exact Enterprise. It's it's somewhere in a box. Um, the but stand the cracked huh? on mine. Um, oh, see, yeah. you remember that. See, it's, but now the David Goodman picture, it's funny. And if you're a little alarmed that he's got a gun, he was a Western guy. And uh, that's a uh, gun. That was a prop gun they used in uh, North Star. North Star was uh, his episode on Enterprise. But if you look at his counter behind it, notice how these are getting more people are getting more and more things. See behind him where he's got like Superman and some of the superheroes yeah. sitting around the. Uh, uh, <laughs> When the we did that, figures. he said, yeah, that's he said, that's my version of the Zindi Council. So, <laughs> <laughs> He's got a, um, a 1701, no bloody A, B, C, or D. Yeah. Um, photographs as well. I mean, that's the other thing that I think a lot of people have in their offices are photographs mm -hmm. of, uh, of people that are important to them. As um, someone in the comments was talking about Picard's fo um, photo album in Generations. Right. Um, as right. a good example, um, Doug's desk. I'm going to bring this back. one up. So Doug's desk is real. I mean, and you go in the art department. It's the same thing in visual effects too, especially wow, they when have you have a lot the of CGI. stuff. There's like there's the, yeah the thing is the art department wall. There's I almost put this in. They're just they just take constantly taking photos of them in goofy times, and they've got that luxury because they've got a large room with a lot of goofy art people. And that's, you know, but that's their environment and they share that. And a lot of times the stuff, some of the stuff they create and make, especially if it's a, a piece or an art piece, is, you know, hanging from the ceiling or it's plastered on the wall. But yeah, Doug's got himself surrounded there with, there's, I could have just gone on and on with this, but you see the writers. Now, what's funny is I was thinking, I go back to, say, Jerry Taylor's office or, or uh, Michael's office. 
And they have some photos. Jerry has her novelization of unification that she did when she was new. And they'll have they'll put up people put awards up. Right. Mm -hmm. But the the older generation doesn't they don't drown themselves in action figures (laughs) and, you know, (laughs) prop toys the way the young. And this is the younger generation, the 90s and aughts. And it's even it's even more. Well, now everybody works at home and you just got your home office there. But it's just it's just a fun thing to think about love of stuff. And here's creatives that are pumping out the Star Trek that we love, the visual or the written word, either one. And they're drowning in their all their fun stuff. But it's also what they've got around them. You know, I'm sure when they get a writer's block or they need some inspiration, they turn around and they do a little bit of playtime, which could be a whole different topic. Yeah. Adult adult play needs to be one of our topics some week. But yeah. Uh, so anyway, there you go. I didn't know if that was a shock this year, this week to you on your K3, but talk no about shock, No style. K3 shock, but just K3 fun there. Um, for some reason, when you talk, uh, when you mentioned adult play, it made me think of Firefly and the scene, um, you oh. know, curse you and your inevitable betrayal. betrayal. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, yeah, I think oh it's oh. um, those are those are uh, uh, great photos to see, and um, I think we all. Um, I, I was just laughing. Um, I was internally laughing when Scott uh, his recent comment. Oh, those horrendous '90s ergonomics um, or lack or total lack thereof. Yeah, there's a a different, completely different era. The monitors being so low. I mean, that was an era where you couldn't. You couldn't really raise those monitors. Those monitors are so heavy. Um, you couldn't do the kind of stuff that we can much more easily do right now. Um, but I will remind uh, Scott that the 90s gave us uh, one of my favorite keyboards of all time, the uh, the Microsoft Natural Keyboard. And it's loud, clickety-clack. I still have a few of those. Now I have a... I have their modern version of it, which I absolutely love. But um, the the nineties, uh, you know, we, we I miss the click. Yeah, I miss the these little skinny, you know, little Apple those things. Yeah, they don't give you the clickety clack, but um, that's better for live streaming. Uh, the clickety clacks are really loud. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the uh, clickety clack. Um, wow. That's great. That's great, Laurie. Uh, Larry. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, there's a there's a I did you know I I didn't even think about it being a '90s time capsule and early in mid aughts there on a couple of them, but I guess it was. I did, I I stopped to there's occasionally I'll look at the like last night I was like. Oh, I bet someone's going to say, oh, look at the 90s computers. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, well, that's what it was. So that's, you know, like, yeah, exactly. All right. Well, let's venture Double forward stone. into our away Sorry, mission. Bob. This is the part of the show where I give you a little uh, recommendations on on what um, on how to apply some of the stuff we're talking about. And it's come up um, a little bit here, here and there, but this idea of... Um, consumerism of of capitalism of materialism has come up a little bit and this is something and we kind of mentioned collecting and when does collecting become um become a problem and um for a long time a lot of the research has shown that materialism can be very bad trying to just acquire objects and things as we saw with that next generation episode um it can be a bad thing. It's been linked to um, linked to feeling worse, linked to uh, more materialism has been linked to feeling more selfish, more more down, having worse relationships. Um, and also we know that in general, buying experiences tends to have, better mental health effects long term than buying things. Uh, for example, um, if you I know it's hard with COVID times, but if you are gonna go on a vacation, the benefit of it of, of that versus buying a new TV, for example, might be that you look forward to the vacation. Um, so you have the benefit for weeks. You go on vacation. You're in a new place, new situation. The experience is good. And then afterwards, you have all the memories to draw from. And when you're feeling down, you can be like, oh, wow, I remember that time we went to uh, Paris. It was so amazing. Um, so for a long time, people have said, like, materialism, bad, not so good. However, some of the more recent research that has shown is when you might be buying things for affiliation with a group or a tribe 
or people or a concept that means a lot to you, it, that can actually be really good. When you purchase something for belonging or a, a reward for yourself, that these these can actually be really good things. So, so stuff is complicated. Um, as uh, Scott said, this should be my new trademark. Um, I have so much stuff to say about all the stuff. Stuff is complicated. It's not all good or bad. And the TV example I gave before, usually when we buy things, we buy stuff, we habituate, we get used to them. You buy the new phone, you got your new uh, computer. Mm -hmm. It's great <clears throat> for a few weeks, but then you kind of get used to it. Well, it depends on the object. It depends on the thing. And for some people, buying a new TV might bring you continuous joy, especially during COVID times when there's not much else we have there. And you might get used to having the TV, but there's new stuff that the TV can do for you. Same thing with a computer. So it's it's complicated. Materialism isn't all good. It isn't all bad. It's, it's complicated stuff. Um, However, what I do want to say, and getting close to an away mission here, I'm going to bring up another example for my daughter. Um, sometimes we can have too much stuff. So she who just knocked on my door, shh, be quiet. I'm not here. She does. Ah! <laughs> she hears me. So um, speak of the devil. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, one thing I noticed, so she's a little over three now, but I noticed that um, <laughs> there was a day where I looked around and I said, my living room is completely full of crap. It is all of her toys from when she was a newborn to now as a, as a preschooler. They were all there. And um, with COVID times, my ability to clean it up, organize it, that had gone out the window. And... Um, I was noticing she was playing with the toys a lot less than she usually does. Mm -hmm. And this has been going on for a long time. And so I did a little bit of looking into this. This is the thing, like, yeah, sure, I'm a psychologist, but um, it's hard to apply this stuff to my own life. Um, and started looking into this and realized that I never put away her baby toys, things that she's outgrown. There's um, there's so many things, and they're unorganized right now, so she can't find the stuff that she wants. And, Larry, this is what did it for me. Right. She would ask me to find a certain toy. Like, where's, you know, I want that Play-Doh toy, that Play-Doh. I'm like, I don't know where it is. It's buried under all this stuff. And then I would spend hours trying to find it, and I can't find anything. So I did a big toy purge. I put away all of her baby things that she doesn't play with, I put away a bunch of her current toys, um, and I kept the ones that she most wants to play with. And I, I got these, uh, I got this like fifty dollar organizer thing, so she can see all of them. So the moral of the story here is, um, <laughs> when we don't see our belongings, they are kind of out of sight, out of, sight, mind. Out of mind. Yeah, and it's very easy for these things to accumulate. And the more stuff that's accumulated, it's very hard to find what you actually want. Um, and so this becomes a very big emotional problem. Ah, as someone's, uh, uh, you know, there, you know, one thing I've noticed about you, Larry, whenever you're looking for something, you have a, you find it. Uh, yeah. I don't try. If I'm live, I'm not going to go find something that I can't put my hands on. But it is <laughs> okay. annoying when that, that one time intent. Yeah. Maybe there are a couple it's... things that are in a box somewhere that I haven't. Un yes. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I just uh, I just see that I, you're only going for the stuff that <laughs> Put you know. Put another one over on you, didn't I? <laughs> and our viewing it's, audience. Okay. It's all it's all an illusion, Larry. <laughs> um, but yeah, when when stuff's out of sight, out of mind, it's 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 very hard to go through it. And when you do go through it, it's a very emotional process. You know, Marie Kondo has uh, become very famous for the whole idea of spark joy, like only keep things that spark joy. So long story short, this is a very long story. What the hell is the away mission, Dr. Ali? Well, here it is. Um, if you find yourself in this situation where there is too much stuff, there is too much clutter, it, it is a very emotional process and it can be very hard to kind of go through it. So my big tip is going to be um, you need to get someone else involved 
and to help you decide like is this something you keep mm -hmm. is this something you store or is this something you donate or throw away and often time if you would if you were able to do that yourself you probably already would have done it but it's too emotional and so that that's what happened with me and my daughter's toys um, especially the baby stuff I it was too an emotional decision for me, um, but my wife was really good at this. So I collected a lot of her baby to uh, toys, and I said, <laughs> "Is this a keeper? Is this a is this something we want to cherish?" And my wife's like, "Uh, no, that was some random crappy toy. We got it from a birthday party. Like, get rid of it." Um, and you you need the help of other people to help you kind of go through this because these things are too emotional for us, especially us Star Trek. You're people. not like, going to throw away Nora's comic book collection, though. Uh, <laughs> Larry, I don't I don't even know if she's gonna ever know what a comic book is. I, um, I don't. But like I um you know or I have twenty thirties equivalent yeah right right <laughs> I have so much Star Trek stuff lying around and this stuff is too emotional for me so a lot of times I I need to kind of go through it with my wife and figure out okay mm -hmm. what's stored like the starships I have so many starships most of them are stored <laughs> away and I have yeah. um because otherwise they would just dominate this whole area and with the little girl it's it's she's gonna break them. So I only have a select few. I have those on display. So mm -hmm. if you're struggling with your stuff, please get the help of someone else and have them um, walk you through. Just to what, bounce it off. You don't need just a, to, you know, yeah. you don't need a yeah. hoarder. You don't need Marie Con. I just, you know, that's fine because there is an extreme. Yes. And to me, it's not about I need to go through things. But to me, it's not about the emotionality. Sometimes it might be emotionality. But with me, a lot of times... And that was like cleaning up my dad's house. It was very – it's like that was in Oklahoma, and it was like, okay, am I going to pay to have this ship back to California or is it staying <laughs> here? And I got into a headset of like finding – like I had all of my high school newspapers that I had been editor of and even when I was a kid. And I'm like, I'll find – uh, you know, like uh, it'll sound pretentious a little bit, but not because they were mine, but because they existed. Like I will find a home for these. Like I – there's some museums that I gave stuff to. I gave yeah. some of my collection yeah. of flyers and program books from Oklahoma conventions to the new Oklahoma Pop Culture Museum. I mean, there's a Larry Nimichek collection box now at the new Oklahoma Pop Culture Museum where I gave a ton of of goods from fandom in the, in the 70s and 80s and 90s that I gave – You know, but I found a place for things um, that way. But to me, it was it's not so much about the emotion as it is um, – am I still with you? Yeah, you're here. Oh, oh, I thought you'd froze. <laughs> no, no, no. I was just reading comments, Larry. <laughs> oh, okay, good. It's that boring. No, I for me it was it turned into a function of time and just management, not even the emotion. But again, your advice about having having even a second person to bounce things off with and to help get you over that hump is is really good. My wife does that all the time. She has people come in to help her clean or to sort things and and do that. Yeah. And it's really helpful for her. Yeah. Yeah, um, there's She's some. Uh, three. Yeah, no, we we all we all kind of we all need that. Um, it's all helpful, yeah. And um, and another quick tip I have is um, take a picture if you're struggling with with an item um, and not you don't know what to do with it. Just take a picture of it. A lot of times that can help us to hold on to the memory of the object. In fact, that's something we often do with hoarding as well as we're helping people to to learn how to get rid of their things as we encourage them to take pictures of it. Um, it's all digital now. It's That's much easier to deal with uh, the digital mess than it is the physical mess. Um, Charlotte says, I'm waiting for the day for Ollie's daughter to live stream bomb us. I think it happened once very early in, um, in Life Support Live's history. It happened on an early episode. Um, I also like Cairo's um, comment here. It's very simple. Put away all toys except the Star Trek ones. Prioritize here, folks. <laughs> um, Scott is saying, um, you left your Trek toys out, though, right? I mean, we're not all savages. Scott, I've got... Um, I have two plush Enterprises that I gave my daughter. This is the one that she less plays with, and so I keep this here in the office. Um, but she has her own... The the plush that she not really quite so loves. white and clean as it yeah 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 that one yeah yeah that one's in <laughs> that one's in her room um, and then Cairo says uh, Larry has oh, a lot fresh of stuff fresh from the dirty nebula yes that's funny. um 
<laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Larry, people are saying you've got us all fooled. Your Star Trek stuff is all categorized, but maybe not your other stuff. Um, and oh. then... <laughs> well, this, there's, there's, yeah, this was cat like when we moved. Things were fairly well categorized, but that's been years now. And it's like, uh... no, I have some really early. There's things that I want that I'm really mad with. My, and also my slide, my studio slides and my own photography is. I had I hired someone ten years ago before we moved to help me organize things, and I thought we had everything. And I keep finding boxes of slides. Th- excuse me, <laughs> thirty-five millimeter transparencies. I keep finding more and more slides from you know, here. Like, it's like okay, oh I need to gosh. go. Through these. I need oh to go, gosh. and that's a little box. There's another. There's another one down there that's like that. But anyway, but that's. I'll be I'll be writing something, or I'll be doing one of our things, or anything, and I go. I need that picture like this. One, I was, I was like all the writers and visual effects and art people with the junk around their desks. Yeah. I started looking for those, and I only scanned about those three. And I'm like, oh come on, I have like five more of these at least. And yeah, it was, I'm that's... like, I'm not gonna do I at three in the morning. Do I want to go digging through albums to go scan slides? So I, I knew that was inter- knew it was entertaining, but it's like three does the job, Larry. Three does the job. But yeah, that's folks, that's am. that's one thing I want to encourage, especially if you have um, old family memories that are um, VHS tapes or their um, film reels. Uh, please digitize that stuff. That stuff breaks down in quality really quickly. Please digitize that stuff as soon as you can. Um, and like, I'm, I, I've got all my family videos. Those are all digitized. What I don't have digitized are photos. There's just so many. Um, I'm, that's mm-hmm. one of my, that was an early COVID goal for me. And then that never happened. Um, and Tim is also saying in reality, all he plays with his daughter's toys when she's not around. Yeah. Don't tell her that, but I do. I love getting her toys that I actually want for myself too. What are the best things about being a parent? Um, Larry, let's open up uh, those. Speaking of frequency. set deckers, there's there's John Dwyer in the resurrection. Excuse me, in the first contact bar. Oh yeah, John Dwyer, the set decorator who died about mm. five years ago, and I never got him on. He his uh, he went downhill before I could get him on uh, Portal Forty Seven. Okay, and me and the Greg Jean built Enterprise for Tribulations. Okay. Oh my God. I'll stop this. Anyway, it's like I've got junk here to scan. I know those are scan. Those are things that are scanned. But no, I've got some. This whole switch to digital media is great for storage. But you had, if you lived in the paper times, you have to get everything over the hump <laughs> to being, you know, scanned. You know, Mel- Melanie says uh, this is something I think we all feel. If only I could afford a bigger place with a couple extra bedrooms um, for all our stuff. You know, Melanie, one of the things here that I've learned from having like a George Carlin th- vibes here, place for yeah. my stuff. <laughs> Um, I have lived in bigger places. I've also lived in like a 300 square foot studio apartment in, in New York City. Um, the more space you have, the more stuff you will accumulate. Like our, our stuff always expands to the space we have. We might have a little bit of space. It's going to get filled up. You have a, a medium amount of space. It gets filled up. You have a big amount of space. It gets filled up. Like that's just something humans do. Do? And it's it might like a be... new freeway or a new highway. You add on two more yeah. lanes, it's, you suddenly got more. Tra- yeah. Oh my gosh! Well, that is such a that's such <laughs> a um, LA thing that happens. LA like like it happens uh, everywhere. It happens. It happens <laughs> ev- everywhere. But it's so I um I, I briefly lived in LA, and I remember you know I drive to like um. When you're driving to Disneyland, you you drive through Anaheim, and then suddenly the freeway gets so big, um, it's it's just like doubles in size almost. It's all that Disney money coming in, but um, it also like gets filled up, and I'm like, how I, this is like twice the size of the freeway I was just on, and now it's already full. Like, what's going on? But yeah, we we um our stuff expands to fill the the void that we have. And that's just, you're just never going to have enough space and for all the stuff. <laughs> work expands to fit the time available and all of yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. well, that's 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 a law in psychology. <laughs> we don't have a lot of laws in psychology, but one law we do have is meetings always take as much time as you give them. So if you set a half an hour meeting, it's going to be half an hour. If you set an hour meeting, hour, if you set a half a day, it's going to be a half day. 
Uh, well, here's something shocking. I've been watching the clock. We've actually we're are we ready to do what Haley? happened? Yeah, yeah. I, I opened we're them like up. Ahead. Um, how are so, we ahead? What what I happened don't know. today? I don't know. We're making this up is... the last four weeks. I don't know. Yeah, the last four. How about last four months, Larry? Uh, <laughs> I know. Well, listen. I want to say something for before I forget this, and we don't have a graphic yet because I'm yelling mm. at people to get me their pictures. But Ali, I want to tell everybody. Uh, our next special event that's coming oh! up. Oh, oh, please do. Yeah, this is. And a, I don't this have has a fancy schmancy for... little graphic today. I'm sorry, guys. We'll yeah. have one by next week. We planned this but, for a while. Please, please. Yeah, yeah. We we've had this planned. Um, thanks to the people we're working with, but uh, I we wanted to make sure everything the nuts were down, nuts and bolts were all go down. We're gonna have people enjoy our watch alongs, and we've had so far we've had one guest. I think so. We enjoy having a guest on. We're going to have, in two weeks, on February 27th, two weeks from today, we're going to have a watch-along and not one, but two guests. No, really, Ali, I'm not kidding you. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone yeah, get no, I, in shock. So here's the thing, guys. We're going to go, we're, guys and gals, we're going to, on, so on February 27th, and we will be promoting this, so if you want to help us promote and spread the word, it's yay. We're going to have a watch-along of the Voyager episode Living Witness. So a one hour episode, you know, 43 minutes, whatever, which is you remember is the EMH wakes up and it's a, we find out it's a copy of the EMH, but it was one that got left behind when Voyager interacted with a culture and hundreds of years later, that culture, the doctor realizes is being taught a historical moment between these two competing groups on the planet, one dominant, one the minority that are grappling with their own social order. And the doctor basically finds out that everybody, even the well-intentioned people, have assumed all these fragments of history completely wrong. <laughs> They're making all these assumptions and presumptions based on fragmentary records. And the doctor's trying, but to correct the record is really socially upsetting to the dominant and the minority groups. And there's a whole struggle to do this. And then there's like a riot and then we jump ahead and the record has been set and it's been clear and they all honor the doctor's program copy for helping set the record straight. And anyway, it's a great, wonderful, mind bending episode. But we chose that because our guests that day are Dave Zapone and somebody else from his crew who are working on the Voyager documentary. And they're about to launch their Indiegogo campaign for it. So they're doing some promotion. But for our format, we thought what better way to have them as guests as to look at. Uh, a great show about the perils of documenting and drawing from history the correct way and the perils of getting it wrong. Correct. And we're talking about a Star Trek documentary versus, you know, major history for major groups of people. But the idea is the same. And we and it's a Voyager episode. So so on mark your calendars, February 27th, we're going to watch along that show and then have Dave and one other person from his team with us. We haven't nailed that down yet. Um to be with us. So I'm really looking forward to that, Ali. And I'm very proud. Yeah, that we me had, too. We had something that fit our format for our, cause they're doing, they're out a lot talking about all this on a lot of other, um, podcasts and video shows, not a ton, but, um, but yeah, I'm excited to do this and it's a great episode and everybody enjoys watch alongs and we'll have some, uh, and I, I look forward to having them reflect on. <laughs> and what's funny is I, I, when they asked me about this and I broached that back and they were like, oh, and you know what? That's one we haven't watched yet. We'll watch it. And, and we need, yeah, we, it's like, yeah, it'll be good research. So, um, or they vaguely remembered it, but they needed to watch some of the key sh And I think that's a, that's, that's probably in a Voyager top 20, I think maybe top 25, maybe, I don't know. Oh. <clears throat> mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Jared, for telling me I have no sound. I apparently muted myself because my daughter was banging on the door, and then I forgot to unmute myself. Folks, oh. all I was saying is I completely agree. I think this is going to be wonderful. It's going to be a ton of fun. It's history. It's psychology. It's Star Trek. It's a watch-along. It's a guest. Um, so it's that's guests. in... In two weeks, next week, we'll have just another boring, normal show like today. And then in two <laughs> weeks, <laughs> we'll have our next special. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, stay tuned, folks. <clears throat> it's going to be um, it's going to be a lot of fun. Oh, my gosh, Larry. Um, what Speaking a of day. Fun, this has been a fun day. I'm yeah. kidding. I'm kind of I'm catching some things. So um, just a couple things here in the chat. I got Charlotte a while back and I said made some comment about Birmingham. She said, Hey now, Birmingham is the blue dot in a red sea. So apologies there. I totally know about blue dots. <clears throat> Norman, Oklahoma. I totally know about blue dots and red seas. So um I totally get that. Um we're talking about everybody enjoyed my floppy disk, the micro tape that I pulled out there. Uh Tate said, didn't Nichelle still have her earpiece? The story is when they sat down for the motion picture first day of filming Nobody thought about that, and Nichelle was like, wait, where's my ear thing? And they were like, oh, we didn't think about that. And somebody ran over to storage at Paramount's. It had only been 10 years, and they found her. The, the earpiece she's using in the motion picture is her 60s original series. It's like the one oh, thing wow. in the original series in the motion picture that's still um, – that's in the motion picture. Oh, wow. Uh, uh, so this uh, was a question um, I was going to ask you, Larry, is mm – -hmm. um, are there, you know, the questions a lot of uh, the actors get is, uh, did you keep anything from the set? Not just of Star Trek, but they get that, every actor seems to get that question about productions they've been involved in. Um, are there any any items you know from our, uh, our principals that, um, um, any prized possessions, any Starfleet uniforms, any, uh, any comm badges, any tricorders, any well, hydro not sprays? I mean, not specifically. I'm sure that they did. And what's what's the telling thing is the last 10, 15, 20 years, look how many auctions there have been when like one at a time items came out, especially when you see not so much a big auction. A lot of behind the scenes people will have things. And then, you know, when they get in their 70s and 80s, they give either for space or they just think this is silly. I'll I'll take the money and let some collector have it. But um, and the statute of limitations on anybody yelling at them, it's long oh, gone. Right, right, right. <laughs> but you, when you see, you know, a lot of actors, they'll have a charity, say, or they'll have some nonprofit that they're working with. Maybe it's yeah. their own, and they'll and you'll see auction items come out for that. So no, occasionally you'll hear, um, and some of them, some, some young actors when their show dies, uh, maybe, you know, pay some bills in the next five, 10 years <laughs> when, they, <laughs> when they auction something and get that done. People forget about that. So, uh, so yeah, nothing right off hand. I, here's a funny thing. I remember it was the finale before Vegas was a thing, STLV, when, when the Grand Slam in Pasadena was the big creation convention was the big star trek convention of the year and there were like five or six of them before things moved to to vegas yeah in uh, 2000 well probably more like six or eight but anyway when the grand slam in pasadena was the big apex convention yeah, i remember i love that year, i love that convention. the year of um the year of the finale of the next gen finale of all good things in 94 patrick and it wasn't sir patrick then sir uh, pa patrick had not from Star Trek, but when he did Saturday Night Live and they did the 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 Love Boat uh, Star Trek crossover show, and they had the really crappy boat model with the nacelles stuck on, <laughs> you know, the decent nacelles. They had a really that they used in front of a blue screen. It was you know with the star thing whirling by. He had that model from Saturday Night Live, that kludgy, goofy ship and nacelles model, and he auctioned <laughs> it from stage. For, for some charity, something, some, you know, may have been for comedy relief even still back then. Anyway, but that's, you know, but that's the kind of thing that happens. And a lot of stars will just grab something and then within the year they'll, they'll throw it into a charity, whatever, their own thing and do that, which is cool too. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, somebody, somewhere, some guy has that goofy, googie model. Uh, and and that reminds me of uh, we didn't even talk about the big Star Trek auction, uh, the Christie's auction that happened. Um, oh yeah, was that well, in the late two thousands? 
No, it was in 06. It was right oh, after six. they'd cut off. There was not going to be any more Berman. Tra- it was right in the hoopla of, the, oh, J.J.'s going to do all the new, shiny, bright, modern, big-budget Star Trek before we... I was like, it's going to be a movie. It's going to be a movie. It won't be a series, guys. I hope it's good, but it won't be a series. It won't be the same experience. And it was like, don't be such... Don't be so negative. In the years before we had social media, I had people say, don't be so negative. I'm, I'm not being negative. I'm being factual. And then the day after the movie came out, everybody was like, oh... This is not like having a series. And like, that's what I tried to tell you. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, that Christie's auction was in 06. They did it as an anniversary. It was like the 40th anniversary. And it was a big, yeah. They had Mike and Denise working on that for a year. And then Dave Rossi came in and helped them when it got crazy. And I I remember towards the end of, yeah, they had. (laughs) I started getting these Polaroids from Dave going, Larry, do you have any idea what this is? And I'm like. I don't know, but if I knew, when do I get a visit to come down and look at stuff? Okay, okay, fine, come down. <laughs> yeah, I um, that was I, I remember well, looking had, through. A, I was gonna say we had the it's a they had that slow motion auction from it's a wrap where they would put five or ten a lot of costumes. Mm-hmm. You know, there were tons and tons of costumes that they just gave to it's a wrap, and for like what a year or two, you had like that weekly auction from it's a wrap of five. You know, you get extras clothing. Somebody found me the vest that I had worn. In um in the finale of Enterprise, it was the mm. Cisco suit, which is nice, but the little the multicolored. And then I I wore it to cons for a while, just on its own when I was doing my fundraiser for my documentary. And then one time I put it on and it ripped, on, <laughs> it oh. ripped on the side, and I was like, ah, okay, in for that. It's going back until. <laughs> oh no, yeah. no. <laughs> but yeah. The um. auction- were kind of, a, but that one big Christie's auction. Even though there had been little auctions along, like when Bob Justman or Herb Solo and people had put their, you know, Matt Jeffries had put their things up. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that Christie's auction was its own. I mean, the catalog books are over there, and it was so funny because everything, almost everything, went for three or four times the value yeah. they assigned to it, and people yeah. were like shocked, and we're like, yeah. no, it's it's a it's totally the Phoenix moment. It's touching the Phoenix, especially the yeah. ship models. When oh, the yeah. oh, yeah. miniatures went for such a huge amount. Oh, it's yeah. like, oh, yeah. did you not see First Contact? Look, yeah. we're touching the Enterprise. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Jared is asking me to um, to talk about Loop. Um, so Loop is the mental health startup that, um, uh, oh. that I'm the psychologist behind. So if you go to loop.co, uh, L-O-O-P dot C-O, you can learn more about it. Um, it's uh, real-time support groups when you need them, um, and uh, it's free. So we're we're really um, we're early in the process, uh, Jerry. The only reason I haven't talked about it much is because there's a lot of cool stuff we're developing. So it's very early in its product journey. But um, yeah, if you're interested, feel free to uh, to try it out. Let me know what you think. Um, so Loop.co for more on mm. that. Um, Larry, we're getting close to that time right. of sh- of day uh, when I have to play what's <laughs> called the sad music. So, Larry, where can people find more of your lovely work this week? Well, the lovely work is at LarryNimichuk.com and, and at LarryNimichuk on Twitter. And uh, wherever you're watching right now, that's the Facebook or that's the YouTube but at Larry Nimichuk on YouTube. Everybody, if you haven't yet, please go and subscribe on my YouTube channel. I'm just trying to get the up. And you know what? Uh, I noticed this, Ali, this week. Uh, I don't know what's going to become of our Twitch channel that we created just for this show. But we're only about, there's a benchmark at 50 followers. And we're like up to just five or six away. So oh, if anybody wow. you know has a Twitch channel, I know it's been creeping up. So I forget to even talk about it. But if... Just for kicks and grins, if uh, you know somebody that has a Twitch channel, get them to subscribe well, to. I LS think uh, Host. I think Zahir has been on. Um, he's been on Twitch today, um, and uh, thank we you. We thank for that, everybody Zaheer. who goes yeah. over and acts like there's people watching us on Twitch. Thank you, Cairo, and thank you, Chris. <laughs> uh, Melody yeah. says uh, loop.co.com. Uh, we couldn't afford loop.com. It's a lot of money. We tried. <laughs> it's a lot we of loot. <laughs> it's yeah loop.com was a lot of money um yeah and uh folks um i am at ali matu on social media i'm also um the psych show on youtube um and uh you can follow my journey along at loop.co if you like to see more about the mental health 
um, how we're trying to give mental health away and kind of scale it up um, using technology. Um, we've got a lot of good stuff coming up in the near future, folks. Um, to stay in touch with us between now and next week, um, check out the Facebook group, um, facebook.com slash group slash life support uh, live. The other thing we always want to make sure we do here is thank you to Scott. Thank you for Jared for moderating and making sure that this is a safe place for all of us. And um, thank you, Scott, for um, editing our episodes for the podcast version of this show. And thank you, Jared, for creating some of the images and uh, cleaning up the thumbnails and doing everything you do. Thank you to everyone here in the community for making this such a positive part of our week every week for this whole pandemic and for however long this pandemic will go on for. <laughs> Um, Hashtag and Larry, for the duration. Yes. For the duration. Until <laughs> next time, uh, sir, live long and prosper, my friend. Yes, you too. Trek well, everybody. <laughs>